Welcome to the Mount Independence State Historic Site. We're so delighted to offer this special presentation today about one aspect of our Mount Independence Collection Stewardship uh, Project. So I'm Elsa Gilbertson, the Regional Historic Site Administrator. And uh, the focus for this project, of course, is Mount Independence, which, as we all know, is a major Revolutionary War uh, landmark. And it was first noted for its uh, historic significance back in 1972 when it was declared a National Historic Landmark. And the state of Vermont has owned property here since 1965. So. Um, after the uh, revolution was over um, and Mount Independence resorted uh, to peacetime use, whatever was left of the defenses, which had been burned by the British, of course, before they left, they kind of gradually just sunk into the earth and the area was eventually used for um, farming. Um, investigations by the state began in 1965 with our first survey and mapping efforts. And then over the years since then, there have been a series of field schools and underwater surveys and our long-term spring surface mapping project, which many of you have been involved in, um, cataloging the recovered artifacts, and uh, geospatial mapping on the landward section of the mount. And that involved, among other things, a drone and the drone was like the same size as the turkey vultures. I thought it was kind of interesting, but luckily they didn't attack the drone. But anyway, in the first year of COVID, some of our historic site staff attended a few online trainings by the National Park Service about the American Battlefield Protection Program grants. And there seemed to be possibilities, because obviously this is really important, in uh, military history, but what to apply for. Uh, then uh, that winter, we were working on a grant received by our friends group, the Mount Independence Coalition, and there are several members of the board here uh, from the coalition, and the grant was to conserve priority metal objects. Well, with COVID, we couldn't work together as we had planned, so I, I was alone upstairs in the winter, in the cold, in the collection room, pulling out objects and sending emails to Mike Barbieri and Mike Blakesley. What about this? What about this? And they responded right away. But when I was up there, all these stories were swirling around, uh, swirling uh, stories that uh, could be told by, through, by and through the objects, by the field school reports, uh, photographs, drawings, maps, and more. So, aha, there was the project to apply for, a collection stewardship project. And looking at the list of grants they'd done previously, there didn't seem to be any specifically relating to co collection stewardship, although it was eligible. So the idea was to start getting our information together in a more comprehensive way, which is what museums like to call uh, intellectual control of the collection. Then that information would be available for staff and researchers, allowing us now and in the future to better understand the mount and determine what studies should be done to fill in the gaps and then used to enhance our educational and interpretive offerings. So, hallelujah, we were fortunate to receive the grant. And the project, it began in earnest, especially last year, and it will be completed next year. So we're working on two fronts to uh, do this uh, sustainable collection stewardship program. So on our end, we were able to hire some of our own uh, staff to uh, do work with the artifacts and document the collections. So um, Toby here, um, he, she uh, has been adding information about artifacts that are only inventoried on paper into Past Perfect, which is a program that's used by museums all around the country. And then, uh, Toby and Mike and Paul at the desk 
task have been photographing priority objects at a high level to add to past perfect and make them available for researchers. And then we've also been scanning reports, photographs, slides, and the like. And uh, there have been at least uh, 1,500 objects added into past perfect, and thousands of them have been photographed. And we were able to buy suitable equipment, and that can be used for the future, too. And then we'll be working on reorganizing our collections areas for easier access. Um, and then, this, that's the first part of the project. Then the second part was hiring qualified archaeological consultants, somebody right over there, <laughs> to review all the mapping and other relevant metadata and ultimately linking the mapping to the artifact database. And that is the main uh, subject of the presentation today. So the methodology for all the components of the project are being documented so we can add information in the future and do this again. Oh, we have some water at the, at the table if we need it. Oh, anyway, we'll bring up the water back there. And uh, the final products will allow our office, the Division for Historic Preservation, to share the information with suitable security Cautions with researchers through the Vermont Archaeological Inventory Map Tool. And some of the information we can also present in a virtual museum through Past Perfect, but that's another story. And uh, already, with um, the, we have received a small grant actually just about a month ago to do planning work for additions to our trail system and that will use the results from this grant to help with the planning process. So um, now I'm really pleased to introduce to you um, the archaeologist, Hutch McFeeders, who's the co-director of the Northeast Archaeological Research Center in Farmington, Maine. And his firm and, the, and its predecessor have been involved in archaeological mapping of all kinds here, here at the Mount for over 20 years and way back when we first started we had this vision that we were going to somehow connect the maps with the artifacts and so it's kind of, we've had to wait this long for the technology to catch up with us and then we're so delighted Hutch to see what you're what you've been up to so thanks so much for coming all the way from Maine for this so take it away. Thank you very much, Elsa. I appreciate everybody joining us here this afternoon. Um, my name is Hutchman Peters, as Elsa said. Uh, I kind of been specializing in GIS for over 25 years now, um, working in the field of archaeology. It's, uh, it's a jack of all trades sometimes. You know, I'm just out there with a the shovel and recording everything. I'm not sure if everybody's expertise here with GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Um, so I'm going to kind of keep it on the low level here, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or, or comments. Um, as Elsa said, there's been various excavations and or digs here on the mountain over the years for a variety of purposes. Research for the construction of trails, for the construction of this building, the parking lot, and, and other things. One of the problems over the years has been everybody's been using their own system. All archaeologists kind of have their own system. <laughs> and so one of the neat things was we needed to get it all tied together. We needed to come together, have go in the same direction from here on out, and get all that past stuff in one spot so everybody can look, do their own research in the future if they needed to, and be able to quickly Instead of spending hours digging through original field records from Starbucks in 92 or whatever, you can quickly click a button and see what happened and, and where the excavation is and what came out of it. It's pretty common today with archaeology that um, we use GIS, tie everything, what we found, negative information to you know, what artifacts did come out. A lot of times we do dig holes and there's nothing in them. So that's been one of the key issues I, I, uh, I addressed here is there was a lot of excavations for the trail work 
and none of that was digitized or mapped. Um, so I want to make sure that negative information was here as well, which will help in aiding designs or, or, or fixing trails here in the future. Of course, there was a lot of excavation on the mount on, in key areas, the hospital area, if you're all familiar with the mountain, um, the south, southern defense area, the storehouse area, um, third brigade area. So we can go through all those things. Um, first, I'm just going to kind of go through our kind of strategy here was to develop one shape file, one or two shape files, and a shape file is basically, in GIS terms, uh, a polygon, let's say, that holds data and can be linked to outside sources. Right now, I know, I know the mountain is moving to past perfect as a database, but previously we were working in Microsoft Access database. And back when I was with the University of the Army Connectological Research Center, we had developed that database for Mount Independence. So before the transition happens to, to the future database, I was still stuck kind of using this old one. But it's not stuck, it's just a step forward. We're going to be moving to that, and hopefully we can get familiar with that and link it here to our mapping information as well in the future. And that's kind of what this shape file is going to allow us to do. They can create fields, x equals x in the database kind of thing. So everything matches and can be easily be researched or pulled up in the future. And hopefully in the future, too, it's going to be very easy. Somebody can online do research and click on a little grid square and see a picture of what Nelson was talking about. So that's it's all coming together. It's coming together pretty fast. It's always been a vision. And we're looking forward to seeing the end product here, probably pretty soon, I hope. Okay. So one of the key things with archaeology is we like to work in grids. I don't know how familiar everybody is here. And everybody kind of has to use their own grid system. And over the years, we've recommended that uh, from any excavation from here on out at the mount is conducted in Vermont State Plain grid coordinates. Okay. So you have a northing and easting, and with today's high, uh, high resolution GPS's, we can easily get on those grid coordinates and start working from there. But in the past, that wasn't so, uh, that wasn't so easy, it was, it, it was doable, but in the world of archaeology, we, we kind of just surveyed in and used uh, transects and trans, uh, transits and tied grids into known areas on the mountain. Um, so basically, I just throw on the big shape file here that I created with all the testing that's gone over the mount, and you can see, you can start to see how zoom in, certainly again in close. But we have the underwater archaeology coming, I've mapped all that, and all the archaeology that's gone for the Star Fort, and all these little sites around the hospital area, the southern defense, and we'll, we'll zoom in on that and, and talk about those. In. So, I guess most of the archaeology that was previously conducted was done by Starbuck. Um, he had a variety of maps, and this was one of his big tie-in maps that he could, was kind of, you know, he used a, a transit and surveyed the mountain and went across the mountain and had all these tie-ins to these sites. What I decided to do was take these grids individually and of course, you know, there's various degrees of accuracy when you're surveying. I'm just going to start going by date here, sorry. Turn this off. Um, I'm going to start here at the Southern Defense area that everybody's pretty familiar with. Uh, you can see this storehouse grid here. Um, you can see another little grid here. So he conducted all this archaeology and he drew these maps and that was the only way to record excavations back then. Nobody, nobody was solidly using GIS. It was available, um, but nobody was taking that GIS, giving it to the state and preserving it that way. It was always re preserved in reports, draw, uh, usually drawn with these hand-drafted maps. 
And these hand-drafted maps are great. They are great for their time. They were a great way of displaying information back then. But now that we have GIS, everything can be more accurate and, and uh, information can be more readily available than a single click of the mouse. So that's, that's the main purpose here is making sure everything is grouped together in one easy, accessible location. So you can see there's some discrepancies from the excavations, from where they are mapped to where they are plotted in my GIS. So those little pink squares represent the test units. And I, we, we accept that error. That's OK. Um, it's basically because hand drafting might not be quite completely accurate over time. And one of the big issues with the Starbuck excavation in this area he used uh, three, four different grids. <laughs> so when we talk about grids in archaeology, our particular company likes to use a northeast grid. So if you think of a square here, we don't pick any square, uh, we work in the northeast. So we label everything in the northeast corner. So north 100, east 100, and you build a grid, and it goes with one meter grids. So, but he chose a different route, which is fine. Every archaeologist does that, you know, have their own thing. It still worked. It was a great way of keeping track of stuff and an easy way to make maps. So he does a, a zero zero grid. So north he, he starts at north zero east zero or south zero east zero. So that would be the zero zero mark. So everything in this quadrant would be the northeast quadrant, northwest quadrant, southwest quadrant, and southeast quadrant. So one of the hard things about that was uh, tying in everything. This was one grid. You'd have another grid here, and another smaller grid here, and then maybe another grid up here. So um, it wasn't one grid. Theoretically, you could have just extended this across the whole area, but it, that wasn't done at the time. So over the years, you reestablished grids. Whatnot. So I'm going to turn on the LIDAR here just to kind of show everybody where, what it kind of looks like. One of the things was, the hard aspects of this was geo-referencing the actual maps versus the LIDAR. LIDAR has become a great tool for us as archaeologists because you can start to see real features on the ground in real time. Okay. We can see the defense mounts here. You can see that right here. That was where the excavation was. I can't remember. There's a litany of little site numbers within this. So, and, but if I wanted to know exactly what site number that was, all I had to do was click on that dot. North, North 14, West 6. I'm sorry, my screen goes out. I'm going to the computer. So let's see what happened there. Yeah, my computer doesn't like running the LiDAR very much, but um, that's all right. So I'm going to click on that again. Some people know this room doesn't like technology yeah, anyway, so yeah. it's a... My screen is uh, blank, so I'm letting a little kernel here. But, um, that's unfortunate. Hold on one quick thing here. Right. Oh, it is 
freezing up in here. Let's go.
can, as long as that number is associated, this number from now on will be associated with these four characters here. Um, and right now, that's how I have linked the database is through this prof number. Um, but because it, it was just a little bit more clean than doing it through the name of the excavation block. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I know I'm speeding through this a little bit. Okay, great. Um, so over the years, we can also do some interesting stuff with GIS. Everything appears to be a little pink block now, but we could also sort by who did it and when they did it. So I could clear a little here and clear my selection, select by attribute. I can say I want to load everybody that dug in is equal to, let's say, 1992. Sorry, I gotta switch between my glasses maybe. And hit apply. And that, and all of a sudden it shows all the excavations that happened in 1992, okay? And you can see over the years we've gone back and forth to some of these sites, which is fine, that's what we want to do, but what we also want to do in the future is make sure that if this excavation here, we want it in, and it's on a certain grid coordinate, we want to make sure we start using the same grid coordinate if we're going to expand off of it, okay? So that's part of the, part of the getting everything together, making sure it's square, making sure that we can work in the future off these, these excavations, and making sure we're not redigging old excavations or, or messing up site numbers. Because some of these site numbers are frankly within a unit of each other. Um, unfortunately, it, not unfortunately, it is what it is. That's how they define some of these sites. So, we can go, let's see what I pick there. Let me go back here, select that one, and see, I want site 216. So back here, go to Starbuck, and I've georeferenced all the maps that were available to me that were in the report. And you can see there's a variety of them. I'm just going to try to find 216. Pretty sure that one had one.
transposing numbers over from the original field records to the map to the database to make sure everything was square. So what we had to do is make some decisions on the fly sometimes by using either the LIDAR, hopefully it doesn't crash on me again when I hear the LIDAR. So a little bit of analysis on this LIDAR and that was the area that they were working at, at that site too. I can't remember what the site number was. Sorry. So okay. site 203 near the hospital. So sorry, we've moved over to the hospital area. That's where I was gonna get into this. Um, you can see this is the big foundation in the hospital when you when you've wrecked it, if you've been out there. Go ahead. Just a real quick question. What's the size of each square? All right, 99% of the time these are gonna be one meter by one meter squares. Okay. So. They they do that was another situation in the database. We made the assumption that the if there was no information on how big the test unit was, we made the assumption that it was a one by one meter square. Archaeologists do dig in 50 by 50 meters, centimeter squares. We do dig in by two meter by three meter trenches. You know, it's just how it's recorded. So we had to make some assumptions sometimes, and sometimes we just couldn't. And I kind of left that data out. If it was not, if I couldn't solve the problem. I kind of just left that data out. And hopefully at some point, somebody can sit down and spend figure it out a little bit more. But I'd say we got about 99% of it here, so I think we're doing pretty good. So back to the hospital so area in Geomai. So this is the hospital so area. I did that. If you're familiar with this, this is the flat area up there. This is the foundation. So when I geo-referenced off his maps, and then the it starts to get a little bit. Things quite line up. But I had I saw through LIDAR that was here, and this is that a beautiful watercolor map there. Again, I just had to go with cows and whatnot. Basically, so it's working in creating a huge grid in the hospital area worked out fairly well. Just kind of, I used the actual locations of the grid, not again geo This feature was obviously very geo referencing. Excuse me, geo referencing. If you're not familiar with it, I don't know. Basically, work because they. Taking an aerial or a picture or something like that and tying it into one fairly familiar fact. When we have when we have grids that history like that, such as the same site here, that map that I just kind of showed you like that about this map that is depicted on the other maps. Um Winter Smith. Building. 
Yes, I tied it scale wise to the point. 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 The park uh, across the street. We all know. We want to make sure we have not have any resources destroyed. Or so if you do, if I did start going really yes. detailed by hand and trying to pin this and pin this to each shoreline, so it's going to be this area that's that been here that was your reference. To get it's well, I think what we wanted to start out by asking that you kind of see the existing stuff. You get this hidden journal on it. Aerial photo, if you're not, which just you're not familiar with it, distorts it, makes it almost unreadable. You're better off looking at like a Hayden Journal map like this. So a lot of things occur over here. GIS, then rather than yeah, GIS, 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 GIS. Great with historical value. Yeah, that's so what we here. And that's value. Testing the documentation in detail. But as far as georeferencing GIS wise, so they are all the big testing and they had a, a, a land rail system at the Crown Point to the Dutch Montreal here. They still want to geo-reference it. Turn off that rail with me. So that's kind of the map of all the Charles has. Any other questions? These trails on this. this you keep saying hi. Is it just you or do you have team? Oh, well. <laughs> GIS. I do the GIS for our company, so I, I work with well, testing. Like I said, this is ESRI that's I GIS, GIS Pro test study program. I do. I, this isn't my favorite program actually. I use another program from them called our GIS Desktop. Um, but this is their new software, and I've been doing it with the GIS. You can see in the database what came out of it. There's a lot of knowledge there. Right? <laughs> 90, one of the early 95 issues I wanted to address um, is the top one. Sure. Is it any chance that North is off so much because it's 200 years ago? No, absolutely. Absolutely address. I mean, the idol right there. Completely Sorry, I'm not. But right, that negative one, that's, that's, that's you know, um, kind of unusual. So Quick news. Uh, sailing and that making doubt that he had. North was north. North, north, north. You do know North has shifted over time. So I wanted to look in, in Google someplace. The old school out. way of doing yeah. how many negative information is just from true numbers good enough to make all the numbers it was at a certain point. I wanted to make sure that but negative was it 20 degrees out? Well, mm -hmm. Probably not. Well, typically, no. sometimes. So these people were probably taking journal entries. Kind of neg the old school way of sounding the negative went on as it was on the giant mapping or and when it wasn't the city mapping. Yeah, they don't turn out of it. Or you have so to think through the how and when they through the north line along their particular cells. Because people like to focus on what they I'm sure there's somebody that is familiar with all the information on recording that negative information. So, anything else? Through the help of Elson doing some more digging, this this was Sheila Charles. Um, we had to very much really dig for her maps and words to find it for this. And I'll put them on now. So, this was a Luckily, they used an existing plan. I can't remember who did this plan, Elsa, off the top of my head. Um, but it was initially drawn, I think, prior to the trail system being developed. Um, so this was very, very easily tied into and georeferenced. So this georeferencing was very accurate. I didn't have, I didn't have, I already had a base, I already had this base map. From a CAD file, so it was and it has very accurate contours. I wouldn't say the trails are extremely accurate, but the contours and some of the other features were very accurate. So I was able to tie that in her testing because what she would do here in the report is just have them labeled like this. And this was the only place that we could find. This map represented 
course, any time she did find something, there were larger units excavated, like in here. Um, so those are the typical maps that we would have seen in her report. So a lot of this stuff wasn't prior, previously recorded except on the maps, these hand-drawn maps, so, or I sort of hand-drafted maps. So we were really lucky to do that and get this, this going as well. So in, in an ideal world, and I don't know why every time I click on something, my computer screen goes blank and freezes up. But anyhow, we can do it this way. If I select here, here. I'm oh, sorry, just the selected features. So we can figure out what came out of there. And like I previous, previously mentioned earlier, um, let's see, let's find something with more than one continent. Or SP, that's good enough, let's see. So I had to, what we had to do was kind of quickly make a new subcode. So SP, usually we work in this data, particular database, we have a primary class, a MAC class and a secondary class. Primary class being metal, secondary class being um, type of metal or tool, uh, like it's a nail, if it's in the hardware, so it gets a secondary description like that. So we had to work down to, for constraints in GIS, we had to work that down to a two letter code. And I also have included that in the database as well, so you'll have a list like this with a new 200 code. And we've seen that you guys have added your own codes, which is perfectly fine. It's what the database is set up for. But you, in the future, when you do that, you might want to add another two-letter code for these as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if we wanted to see, like I do SP, I can go down my list now, and SP would be a metal staple. <laughs> So, you have a variety of things, research potentials like that. If you were researching metal staples, there you go. Or you can go through, let's find something cool, musket balls maybe. Let's see if I can quickly find a musket ball. Musket ball is an MB. Try to keep the codes pretty good there. So. Let's clear this selected, whoops, I didn't mean to copy those. Let's select by attributes, now we need all testing, new selection, and we're going to, what field, we're going to go MB. Sorry, I'm going to switch between my lines. These unfortunately aren't in alphabetical order. Feel free to ask anything, okay? 
So, so each each field of like SD and B that represents a particular kind of artifact. Exactly. Yeah. Artifact. Exactly. Um, let's see. So also we had a little underwater excavation archaeology go on. Cohen and uh, I wanted to bring up that as well. It isn't just Starbuck and, and Charles and a couple other little excavations, but uh, we also had some underwater underwater archaeology go on, and that was quite interesting. Not to mention, because I'm a terrestrial archaeologist, but they quite use a different system than, than I'm used to or, or whatever. It took quite a lot of handwork for the underwater archaeology, but that was all right. Um, he had, let's zoom in, start here. So he had sampling transects, which is what we use in archaeology, and he pulled them offshore. And the only thing with the underwater archaeology is it's not cataloged yet, if I'm correct. It's well, not in our database. Yeah, it's, Toby put it right into past perfect. All right, into past perfect. Because it was all on paper. Okay. So yeah. hopefully, you know, and if you guys need any help, reach out, we can link this now to the past perfect, I hope. I haven't worked with past perfect, so it, his stuff was not in our database here in Access. So in the future, we will be able to just click on one of these and figure out what it is. So the linking field, Toby, for this excavation would be the prob number again here. Um, you'll see nothing, nothing will show up in these database fields because I do not have that information in the access. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me clear that because that's clear. Let's let's select let's select cold. So we did these sampling transects, these lines, and he had datums on shore that he referenced each one of these. Now I don't. I know this shows in the water, but these were actually on shore. This is just a poorly drawn map. And hopefully, let's turn off this and let's see if my lidar works now. Still a little fuzzy, but these these datums I geo referenced his maps, and it was a little bit tough, but I I'm pretty sure these are fairly accurate on on his datums. So he had. Datums for recording artifacts up here, and you have these sampling transects based off this datum here going down the down the south southwest shore of Mount Independence. So all his all of his fine spots are listed here, and he had, of course, as we know, sunken cannons, a, a sunken cannon. I'm going to turn on his maps. So I've drawn pretty much everything that he had in his mapping data. Um, so you'll see like transect, let me just show totally dealing with it. So there's a transect. Let me zoom in a little bit more. And right there, it'll pop up. 1992, transect L. So he had kind of a weird system where numbers started this way and letters started this way, whatever I figured out. So, um, so when you get that past perfect database, this would be your linking prop, would be your linking item, which would contain this information forever and whatever you link to. It would be transect L, distance, 40 meters. I mean, sorry, 40 feet, they used to be. So, <laughs> so and all these dots represent a fine spot within these test, uh, sampling transects underwater. He also, I also drew some of these larger polygons, let me turn them off, and you see his underwater features with the cannon that's right here, okay? These were drawn even more accurately. Let me see. Right here, and I geo referenced them of those spots as well. So again, if some little some intern wants to someday draw these in, or you can take a picture from 
the sort of shot or and the cannon and it'll pop up online in the future very easily, right, right where it was found. Okay. Um, and then also we also know he mapped the caissons, caissons, excuse me. Um, zoom out a little bit. A couple more features of geo-referenced. Right here, you'll notice they're upside down, but every, he seemed to like to put in more to the <laughs> upside down maps in his thing. That's right. So feature two, uh, but once you figured it out, again we could draw we could draw these at some point, or have somebody draw them at some point for a fun little activity, so you could pop up and see the actual artifact in the future online. Okay. Can we link our photos? Yeah, absolutely. So they, they they already. Photographs every darn one of those. Yep, absolutely. You'll be able to link your photos right to okay. those. Okay. Um, at some point, on, I think it's going to be online, right? That's the whole uh, initiative, right. I believe. So, yes, at some point, you'll be able to click on this one, see the picture of this one. Obviously, somebody's going to have to. I've drawn a larger blob just to kind of incorporate, and I'll turn on that area. I've kind of just drawn a large square to kind of incorporate that whole area. Okay, if somebody wants to do an individual thing, an individual polygon or circle around this, they they can, based on whatever convenience that is or whatever artifact number that we're calling it. Okay, and that pop up will come up in the future. Um, <coughs> so again. Uh, as we know, the caissons, I'm just going to zoom out and turn those off before I lose them. I'll turn off the transects. Um, and I'll turn off this. And let's see, submerge. So also, you know, as as we know, we he mapped the bridge that crossed over to Fort Ty. So through a little bit of geo-referencing, I'm turn on the lidar here, so we kind of know where we are. Yeah, these are the datums I mentioned on the previous shoreline, and these are the best geo-reference datums I can figure out at, at, at this time. Of course, we also notice. That one might be sitting in the water based on the LIDAR. I don't, it, to be extremely accurate, I would have needed to know the lake level when he did this and put <laughs> in. And I did not have great uh, tie, -in for, tie in information from his data. So I used the LIDAR maps as the base for most of his tie ins. But it fell very accurately, I feel, based on. Let's see, let me move his above this. So you can kind of see a shoreline going like that, a little point coming down, and it kind of follows the LIDAR. Okay? And that's kind of what I was using. This one's more broad. He had other, sh other shoreline plans that were more accurate, or more detailed, I should say, and those fell in even better. So, still tough to say where the water line was, but it drops off fairly quickly over here anyway, so I'm sure that might be fairly close. So yes, there is room for maybe improvement in the future for some of this, but we do know um, the Cohen maps, let's see, did I turn off that? and go to caissons right here. So using both shorelines and the datums here as a start, I was able to geo-reference this. And when I pull a scale, it matches very accurately to his scale. So I'm fairly confident this is pretty close. So what I did is, again, I went in and quickly drew boxes around all those caissons 
and, and we all know the floating bridge is approximately in this area because it came off this landing here on the LIDAR. You can see this on Fort Ty, you know how steep it is on this southern exposed ledge. And we all, you can kind of see the ramp coming down here on this. So we all know the bridge kind of did this and we can get into the historic maps, which I'll get into here in a little bit as well. So, okay. And any questions on, on that? Okay, great. So, one of the other little additions to this, uh, this program was to take a series of historic maps <coughs> and geo-reference them. Now, historic maps, you've all walked through the building and we, we see different historic maps representing Fort Ty and, and Mount Independence here through Lake Champlain setting. Of course, all of them have, some of them are beautiful, very artistic, and some of them are very detailed. So, historic maps are great. They give us a lot of information, a lot of, uh, a great idea of what the setting was back then, okay? But some of them are obviously more artistic than, than accurate, I would say, okay? <laughs> so, it, it doesn't, that's not a big deal because I think they're still, we're back then, we're in usable maps. You could use those maps to navigate, no problem, guaranteed. Would it be, could you know exactly your miles or kilometers? Probably not. You know, in a small detail, maybe, but over the larger scale, definitely not. Um, so geo-referencing, I'm gonna turn the testing off. And I'm definitely not running the contours because that would definitely crash. So let me just maps. I'm going to use the LIDAR as our base map for now. Actually, I actually also brought a, an 1896 topo, USGS topo, just for the fun of it. So, 1896 Topo, we easily can relate this map to, to modern day USGS Topo maps. Um, we've all seen them. I didn't actually bring one here today, but uh, you can picture in their head what they look like. They relate to the aerials very well as well. Um, you can go aerial, you know, and we can see the detail map. You can see the wetlands coming up and on, and they're even mapped. On, on the 1896 topo. So, great information, again, great for navigating, traveling, perfectly fine and accurate. So, using LIDAR and aerials and, and older maps, it was kind of a progression how, how to tie in these older maps. There's certain features that were obviously very, very important for these maps, Mount Independence and Fort Ty being one of them. We all know it's a little pinch point in the lake there, great defensive lip position. So I'm going to just kind of start and excuse my pronunciation of some of these names. I know you guys are somewhat more familiar than I am. Um, the Hayden Journal was one of the older maps. I can't remember the date on that, Elsa. Um, it was almost impossible to geo-reference. When you, when you work with, I should have brought the originals and not the uh, geo-referenced ones. I think that's it, Mike Barbieri, isn't that 1777 for his yeah. journal? Yeah, um, there's two Hayden Journal maps. One's a little more detailed than the other. The other, the, the, this previous one, 13B, was almost impossible to georeference just the scale and how compact things were. In, in, in georeferencing historic maps like this, there's, there's a series of problems. There's obviously the scale and accuracy presents the issue. And there's what we call negative space. See, even though this map here has negative space, when you georeference a map that has a lot of negative space, there's no information to pin. So that map gets stretched and mangled a little bit and doesn't fit quite well. 
So what I really did on a lot of these historic maps is I clipped them. I just you know, used Photoshop and clipped out some of this negative space. That presents another little problem. Some of the negative space contains what? It contains the key. <laughs> so what, do you, what information do you want to sacrifice for accuracy? What information do you want to uh, keep with the map? These aren't meant to be down, you know, these aren't meant to be geo to put on the Library of Congress for research to see who did it in the scale and, and keys like that. So I decided to, I decided to clip most of the keys if it needed to be clipped. Um, you can easily bring up the original two screens these days. It's easy with the computer. If anybody wants to research it, they can look at it. So I took a lot of this inf negative information, or negative space, and I removed it from these historic maps to try, try to piece things in a little bit better. So Hayden was one of the worst ones. There's a couple other better ones, but I wanted to show you some, some of the good ones as well that worked out pretty well. We all are familiar with the Winter Smith map. They're all on top of each other. These, this is, works like a layer system. So 